so we will go ahead and get started. So hello, everyone, and thank you for being a part of our second annual National Alzheimer's Buddies Virtual Symposium. My name is Jillian Lee, and I'm the CEO at National Alzheimer's Buddies. National Alzheimer's Buddies is a nonprofit that seeks to alleviate the social and emotional challenges that stem from Alzheimer's disease through building friendships with college volunteers who regularly visit Buddies. We believe that the resident volunteer connection serves the purpose of engaging the residents and enabling them to overcome the daily social challenges of Alzheimer's disease. The topic for this year's symposium is breaking through sex differences in dementia. Women are two times more likely than men to be diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. It is essential for us to educate ourselves on this topic and to learn more about these inequalities. Today's symposium will consist of two keynote speakers, a panel discussion, digging into the sex differences in dementia, an update from the Sanchez family, and a roundtable discussion with caregivers, family members, and advocates discussing the impact of Alzheimer's disease. We'll be, we will be starting off today with our first keynote speaker, Dr. Michelle Mikeley. Dr. Michelle Mikeley is currently an associate professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Neurology at Mayo Clinic. Dr. Malky works as a transitional epidemiologist to identify fluid and neuroimaging biomarkers for the diagnosis, prediction, and or prog progression of neurodegenerative diseases. The principal research interests of Dr. Malky are, the further, are to further understand the epidemiology of neurodegenerative diseases and the sex-specific differences and the risk and progression of these diseases. Her work on sex and gender differences in disease risk will contribute to better precision-based medicine for men and women. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Michelle Mikeley. Thank you so much, Jillian. And, and um, also for, for the honor to talk with you today. Um, and, and I also wanna thank all the volunteers out there who are part of the Alzheimer's Buddies, which is, is just um, phenomenon. Let's see, so hopefully you can see this. Um, there we go. So today, uh, very quickly, I'm going to start out by briefly summarizing the epidemiological research examining sex differences in Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, and then talk about um, some of the sex and gender differences in risk factors as well as sex specific risk factors. So the first question is, are, are women more affected by Alzheimer's disease and related dementias and are women at greater risk of Alzheimer's disease? Um, these are two different questions, and we often hear that women are at greater risk of Alzheimer's disease. This has been published in headlines um, of some of the nation's top papers and, and um, uh, you know, throughout the media. However, I want to show you that um, when we look at the epidemiological data, uh, this becomes less clear, and you can see that it will depend on the definition that we use. So first, if we're concerned about the overall frequency or count of Alzheimer's disease, about two thirds of those with the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease dementia are women. However, it's, it's important to point out that age is the biggest risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. And there are more women living at older ages than there are men. Therefore, like almost all aging related diseases except prostate cancer, there are gonna be more women than men diagnosed with these diseases. So the, the next question is, um, are women at greater risk? That is, do they have a greater incidence? So for example, if you have men and women at the age of 80 and you follow them for five years, are more men or more women likely to develop uh, dementia over that time frame? And as you can see from um, this graph, it really depends on um, the country and area of the world. And so the, the top three graphs, as well as pooled European data, um, show that you know, women do have a greater incidence or risk uh, in many of the European countries. And this particularly starts uh, after the age of 80 or 85. Um, pooled Eurodem data, um, which consisted of a, about 13 or 14 countries, again, we have a greater risk. However, when we look in the United States, uh, the Framingham uh, Heart Study, but which had a dementia component, as well as in uh, the Rochester Epidemiology Project in Minnesota, we don't see a difference in terms of the incidence. Now, it, you can see that this study was published in 2002, and I, I really like it because it does lay out uh, some differences between Europe and the US, but there, of course, have been many, many studies that have been published since this, this time. 
And of those studies, there's only one um, for Cache County, Utah, um, that did find a greater risk for women after the age of 85. But generally in the US, when we're specifically looking at incidents, we don't see a difference. Uh, in Europe though, um, there are still many studies that are coming out that do see differences. So a, a huge question is, um, you know, what are some of the, the potential explanations for these disparities? And I'm happy to talk a little bit more in, in detail later, but one of the differences across these the continents are the social, cultural, and historical events that have taken place. And I'm an epidemiologist, and from an epidemiology perspective, this is fantastic because it's likely not specifically due to genetic differences. So if we can identify some of these factors that might increase risk in one place versus another, we can potentially um, modify them. And of course, there have been differences in terms of Europe and the US. Um, certainly, uh, women particularly experienced World War II and the Cold War differently uh, for those living in the US versus Europe. And so a question that uh, we're pondering right now is whether European countries will see a similar sex difference in future generation um, when there aren't these as many of these stressors. And even across the US, it's important to think about some of these geographical differences because uh, north, south, east, west, certain states, there are stresses and societal impacts that could affect men and women differently. So, you know, one of the, the discussions that often comes up is that, okay, so if men and women do actually have the same incidence, again, there's more women with a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease because women live longer, but if they have the same difference or um, prevalence, is there a reason to keep examining sex differences? And so for that, um, I say, absolutely. If we think about cardiovascular disease, we know that there are different risk factors for men and women. We know that there are different treatments. There are different symptoms for a heart attack for men and women, and there's different um, morbidity and mortality. So, you know, even though it's the number one killer for both men and women. Um, so even if the prevalence or incidence is the same, the mechanisms by which men and women can get there may not be the same. And uh, I'll show you some, um, a, a couple examples of that. So it's still really critical to examine sex and gender differences. So as an example, um, this is a study that we did in the Mayo Clinic study of aging where we tried to identify what risk factors were more important for men and for women in terms of developing cognitive impairment. And we found that some factors were equally associated um, with risk of cognitive impairment for both men and women, specifically low education, self-reported memory concerns, and a history of stroke or atrial fibrillation. Among women, however, we do tend to see um, stronger risk among those that have cardiometabolic risk factors, um, specifically midlife, hy midlife hypertension and high cholesterol seem to be important risk factors for women, as well as smoking status. In men, in contrast, we see um, that obesity, BMI greater than 30, and being never married or uh, widowed do, appears to be a stronger risk factor for cognitive impairment. Gender roles such as education, with women historically having less access to education than men, particularly for those that are at greater risk right now, and also work family experience may also affect the risk of dementia. Um, Elizabeth Rose Maeda at UCLA and colleagues recently examined the effect of employment, marriage, and childbearing between the ages of uh, 16 and 50, and examined memory decline after the age of 55. They found that women who worked had less cognitive decline than women who did not. And notably and importantly, this association remained regardless of whether the woman took time off while having their children for several, several years and came back to the workforce, um, whether they worked part-time or full-time, or whether they were single um, or partnered. So thus, it's important to also consider gender roles across the lifespan, which are changing, and what some of these secular changes might, be, might mean for future risk of dementia down the road. But lastly, I'm just going to touch on uh, transitioning to sex-specific risk factors. And so with women, this of course can be uh, pregnancy, menopause, and uh, estrogen uh, hormone use, um, or specific uses of hormone. 
So with regard to pregnancy, factors that could affect the future cognitive health may include the reproductive span, um, hypertensive pregnancy disorders, or gestational diabetes. And hypertensive pregnancy disorders, the long-term impact on the brain is, is one area that we're currently interested in right now. And we have shown that those women that have gestational hypertension or preeclampsia do have worse cognitive performance and lower brain volume, even at the age of 60 years. For menopause, factors um, could include the symptomatology over the menopause transition, for example, whether you have severe hot flashes or not, um, as well as the timing um, and age of menopause. So recent data and, and some of the work that um, we're also examining finds that um, premenopause, which can be due to ovarian insufficiency, so early menopause, which would be more natural, or removing both ovaries prior to the age of 40 or 45 years is associated with later risk of cognitive decline and dementia. And we just had a paper that was published in, in about last month showing that women who do have both their ovaries removed before the age of 45 have a twofold greater risk of having cognitive impairment in later life. And, and then lastly, it's hard to talk about sex specific differences without just mentioning hormone use. In terms of dementia, there's very little, I mean, hardly any studies that have looked at contraceptive use. Um, of course, more studies have looked at menopausal hormone therapy. And while I wouldn't advocate the use of this for preventing Alzheimer's disease, it does look like now that uh, for women that have severe symptoms, if they take menopausal hormone therapy around um, during the time of menopause uh, for a short period of time, that they are not at risk of cognitive decline. So um, just a, a quick summary, um, I, I've showed that yes, it's true, more women than men have Alzheimer's disease, um, but the prevalence and incidence when we take into the count the denominator are a, a little bit more equivocal. So, uh, you know, as a field, I, I think we do need to be careful how we present this. It's important to acknowledge that there are more women than men, um, but it, it's also a, a little concerning too, because we, we, I've had many women come to me and say, why am I at greater risk? Well, part of it is, is living longer, but we really need to move beyond that and study some of the different risk factors. Um, right now, there are, are still too few studies that examine sex and gender differences in risk factors. Most studies adjust for it in, instead. And by adjusting for it, you're basically removing the opportunity to look to see if there are differences. And so as a result, we don't know in the literature if um, people that are reporting differences find a difference, and those that don't find a difference don't report it and, and just adjust for it instead. So with uniform reporting across study, we'll be able to, to better understand that. And um, there's also a, a really serious need to examine um, risk factors and sex differences in, in more diverse cohorts. Uh, for example, I, I collaborate with some colleagues uh, in Chicago, and in, in their study, the average age of bilateral oophorectomy or removal of both ovaries for white women was 49 and for black women was 40. And so there's a huge discrepancy there that um, we need to understand and, and further look among black women. Um, also hypertensive pregnancies are more common among black women and, and Hispanics as well. And even again, with the same prevalence of a, of a disease, the mechanisms can, and risk factors can differ by sex. And we really need to look at this across the lifespan. So for women incorporating contraception, pregnancy, menopause, and, and other factors. And then again, um, to examine this, both the intersection, not only sex and gender, but from a diversity and disparity standpoint. So I, I know that was really quick. Um, I, I'm very happy, you know, please feel free to email me and, and I, I can give my email address to Jillian if you have any questions or are excited about this area. And, um, you know, thank you again for, for uh, being a, a part of this group and um, for volunteering your time and I'm happy to answer any questions. Awesome, thank you so much for that presentation. And um, we have received a few questions from the audience as well. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started on some of these questions. Um, the first question asks, has there been any studies that have examined sex differences in Alzheimer's disease in non-European countries, for example, in Asia, Africa, or South America? There are some studies. Um, there, there's not a lot. And, and actually, we've developed with the Alzheimer's Association, we now have a, a diversity and disparity sex and gender interest group. 
where we have uh, people we, we meet monthly from uh, across the world as best we can given all the time zones. And there are um, a couple studies that have come out of Asia, um, specifically China, and, and they do suggest a higher risk for women compared to men. Um, and a couple in, in Latin America that uh, generally have not found a difference in terms of incidence. And so what, what we're trying to understand too is that of course there's different culture and, and opportunities for women in different countries. So trying to figure out how those play into some of these difference, differences in terms of risk. Awesome, thank you for that response. Another question that we just received was, um, they were wondering if there are any helpful factors that can help prevent progression of Alzheimer's disease. Um, so I think, you know, once a, a person is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease or even cognitive impairment, um, in terms of progression, we, we often um, advise similar for um, prevention as well. So we know, you know, cardiovascular risk factors can contribute to greater decline. And so, you know, sometimes people may think that once somebody's diagnosed with dementia, we shouldn't treat their high cholesterol or, or blood pressure, but it's still important to do that because it, it, it may slow and, and reduce some of the comorbid vascular pathology. Um, I, I think social engagement is, is really, really critical, which is uh, why what you're doing is, is so important. Um, and, you know, if you can get people to, to socialize and exercise and just stay as active mentally and physically, that's also very helpful. Awesome. I believe you kind of touched upon this just now, but are there any lifestyle changes that can be implemented in these risk factors? Um, so, again, I, I guess um, it depends a little bit on whether you're diagnosed or you're looking at progression. Um, regardless, though, again, um, you know, the heart brain connection is very important, controlling for vascular risk factors and staying socially and, and cognitively engaged and having that good social support. Awesome. Um, and then we'll do one more question before we move on to our panel discussion. Um, how can treatment options be personalized based on males and females? Uh, honestly, they're, they're not at all right now. <laughs> I mean, we're really at the point where we're trying to understand what some of these differences are so we can have personalized treatment options down the road. So that, that's really our ultimate goal and, and something of, um, that really is a reason for the research that I do. Awesome. So um, Dr. Malkley will be joining us as we continue to our first panel discussion on sex differences in dementia. We are now gonna have our three panelists, Dr. David Goldberg, Dr. Macy Smith, and Dr. Balsberry introduce themselves as well. Um, please tell us a little bit about yourselves and your involvement with Alzheimer's disease. Questions were sent in, but please continue to use the Q&A button to continue to submit questions. We will start with Dr. Goldberg, who is joining us for his second year in a row. Hi, everybody. I'm, I'm David Goldberg. It's, uh, thank you, National Alls Buddies, for inviting me back. I uh, <clears throat> enjoyed speaking with you all last year. So I am um, a hospitalist at uh, ECU Health in Richmond. I also work at a rehab hospital called the Sheltering Arms Institute. Um, I've been involved with Alzheimer's ever since uh, my grandfather passed away in 2010. Um, I work with the Alzheimer's Association. I work with uh, an organization called HFC, formerly known as Hilarity for Charity, to try to um, help those living with Alzheimer's and their families. And uh, I'm happy to be here talking with you guys today. Awesome. And then now, Dr. Smith, if you'd like to introduce yourself as well. Good morning. Uh, hi, everybody. I bring you greetings from Columbia, South Carolina, where it is cold and rainy. I'm a licensed social worker. I'm a gerontologist. I own a geriatric care management business here in Columbia. It's called Diversified Training Consultants Group. I am also the author of a Dementia Caregiver's Got to Care and assistant professor at Benedict College here in Columbia, South Carolina, which is an HBCU, Historically Black Colleges and Universities. So I really appreciated Dr. Milky mentioning those uh, um, diversity and disparity factors there. I'm also an advisory board member with Lisa's Care Connection, which is a caregiving community that provides free services support for caregivers who are caring for adults with disabilities, Alzheimer's and dementia. And I have about 10 more jobs, but 
I think that that's good enough for today. I'm also a court appointed guardian. So I provide uh, support services for um, adults who may have been subject to abuse, neglect and exploitation. Awesome. Thank you guys for those introductions. Um, I know Dr. Ballsberry will be joining us um, in a little bit, but we'll go ahead and get started on some general questions. Um, feel free to answer whoever wants to take on the questions. Our first question today is, how does a shifting US population and an ever dynamic social relationship with older adults affect the style of care received by Alzheimer's patients? I was just gonna see if chivalry was dead, Dr. Goldberg, but I see it's not. <laughs> So I'll start off with that question. Jillian, that's an excellent question. I will say the shift that I see and what I've seen over the past, I would say about five, six years is the millennial caregivers. And there are lots of millennial caregivers on the line today. And this pandemic has certainly shined a spotlight on the disparities in the aging community in general and the downplay of family caregivers who are the backbones to the long-term care system. So if anybody is on social media, you will see that on TikTok, you either have to be 12 or 92 to be rocking on TikTok. And so I think technology has really advanced um, the opportunity for our seniors to receive care because now a uh, third party insurances are reimbursing for telehealth, which should have been the case years ago. And so for individuals who are living with dementia who may have some type of phobia or fear of leaving their safe zone in their house, I had several clients who would not even go to the doctor because of fear. And then the pandemic added a, a, an additional layer. And so the opportunity for them to receive care via technology is ideal. Um, I always believed in physical distancing, but I never believed in social distancing. But before y'all call the public health police now, I believe that we are all social beings. And Dr. Milky mentioned it, social engagement is just as important as going to get your physical and also um, uh, treatment. So I will say just the technology piece of it and also the millennial caregiver and the jargon that our seniors are, uh, are using to say that whole intergenerational uh, engagement piece is absolutely therapeutic. Awesome, thank you for the response. I realized um, Dr. Balsberry has joined us. Dr. Balsberry, if you would like to just introduce yourself um, and tell us a little bit about yourself, that would be awesome. Good morning, everybody. I'm Dr. Joy Spalsbury, or Dr. Joy, as some call me, or Joy. I'm a psychiatric epidemiologist by training and, an, um, and also a health educator. Um, I'm an associate professor of neurology at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, Missouri, and the inaugural lead of the Health Disparities and Equity Corps in the Knight Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. My research focuses on eliminating health disparities across the life course using community and patient engaged research. So we do research from, from women's health all the way to palliative care um, in my lab. And Dr. Michelle Milkey is actually a close friend and colleague. So it is, I used to, I was at Mayo for almost nine years. So Dr. Milkey and I have been close friends and colleagues for a really long time. So it is wonderful to see you, my friend. And thank you so much, everyone, for this opportunity. Awesome. So we'll continue on. Um, we were just getting started on some general questions that anybody can be feel free to answer. Um, our next question comes in. It says, what are the most common and most glaring challenges that physicians and caregivers face in the research and treatment of Alzheimer's disease? Do you want to go first, Dr. Ball, Dr. Barry, or I'm happy to have you guys go first. Okay, so I'm gonna, so for me, I'm also a caregiver. My mother does not have Alzheimer's disease, but she has had some concerns with cognitive health related to seizures and a few other things. Um, and I will say that I think one of the biggest concerns that we've had as a family is making sure that the care team actually listens to her concerns. Um, and then listens to our concerns. Um, we actually had to go through a process where we had to switch her entire care team because she wasn't being listened to. 
And so now that meant, you know, going to a gerontologist, that meant changing her primary care physician, that also meant changing um, her, you know, other folks that were on her care team, including nurse practitioners and um, PAs. But the other thing that I found that for as a caregiver, that's been really important to me, and I've also noticed this even in my research, is making sure that I'm taking care of myself. Um, I, I've canceled doctor's appointments either because of work or because I've had to do something with my mom or something for my husband. So making sure that we take care of ourselves, I think is just as important um, as well. And then uh, Dr. Goldberg, I'll, I'll pass the virtual microphone to you um, in case there's other things that you'd like to add. Yeah, everything you're saying is, is, is what similar to what I was going to say. I think access to health and knowledge of available resources is something that's striking. You know, every time I take care of somebody who has Alzheimer's, I talk with their family and say, are you familiar, you know, with the Alzheimer's Association? And most of the time the answer is no, which is kind of crazy to me because um, there are so many resources available to them. So having access and knowledge about that, I try to share that um, with people and then even if you give them the resource you know the you know the number to call or the website you know still have to getting the care that you need is still I think it takes a lot of work to get that and uh, unless you have a streamlined healthcare system that is set up and equipped to do that it can be really challenging and I think another challenge is again just like that like people were saying before the treatment options are very limited uh, you know there's been a couple of medications out there on the market that may you know help for a little while but not not that effective there's a new drug on the market now uh, aducanumab that is very controversial um that just came out um and so i think that is uh going to be interesting to see how that plays out so i think you know more research needs to be done i think the good news is you know this is like one of the few issues that's bipartisan where you know funding for alzheimer's has increased significantly significantly in the last 10 years um, but we need more access to, um, you know, research, but also for caregivers and, and similar to what people were saying before, like millennials are, I think, and the next generation are going to be, um, Gen Z is going to be the one, you know what, I need help if I'm going to take care of my loved one. Like this whole, you know, unpaid caregiving thing is going to get out, is, is already out of control, but it's going to get even more out of control. Um, as uh, as our parents and grandparents age. So I think those are going to be some of the major challenges. You know, I, I, just to add on to what um, Dr. Goldberg mentioned, um, I agree. We're, we're part, many of us are part of that sandwich generation where we may have kids or, um, or other or young people that we are caring for or that are part of our responsibilities. Um, the jobs that we have, the careers that we've chosen, our partners and spouses, and then our, our parents that are becoming elders. And so when you're in that sandwich generation, you're, you're often trying to figure out, okay, which way is up? And I know Dr. Goldberg mentioned um, Aluham, which is the new drug that just came out that received FDA approval. I actually had colleagues step off of the FDA panel because of the disparities that might be linked directly to that drug. So for instance, that particular medication costs about, I think the average was going to be about 56000 a year. And it's still unclear if um, Medicare and Medicaid will cover it. Um, so the insurance reimbursement hasn't even been taken into account. And then when we go into the clinical trials and we look at the diversity of the participants that were in the trials, it lacked diversity. Um, in terms of sex differences, and I know I'm sure Dr. Milky has talked about the difference between gender and sex. It lacked um, self-identified racial diversity as well. And then there's the disparities that happen not only based on the cost of the new medication, but also based on the access to the medication. So for instance, it is only administered at an infusion center. If someone doesn't have transportation to get to the center, if someone doesn't have time off from work for an infused medication. And so we, so in some ways we need to think about the lessons learned from our colleagues in cancer, 
where they're trying to reduce the numbers of visits. They're trying to change their medications in a way that, um, that it offers more equity. And so I think that that's a big, a big concern as well. So maybe just, to, I, I didn't go over differences between sex and gender. I didn't have time, happy to do that. <laughs> um, you know, but um, it, we've talked about it, like with the Alzheimer's Association and, and, and there are um, a, a lot of, there, there is a lot of support out there, um, but there's also a lot of geographical holes. So especially for more rural areas, um, that there's a lot less services. And I, and I know with our uh, family and my husband's side, we, we've had uh, some of those, those complications. And, and then um, again, kind of talking with the disparities, um, the, the greatest increase in, in numbers will be among um, African-Americans, Hispanics, and also Native Americans. And we're, you know, we are trying to work with some Native American tribes here. And, and that's kind of where one of the holes are, where they, they don't have that support. So there's still an awful lot of work that needs to be done in, in terms to make sure everybody in the U.S. has has better access to to support and to care. Definitely. We'll dive right into a question um, that was submitted from our audience. Um, they say, hello, panelists. Thank you for your insight. Are the advices you give caregivers different for males versus females, dementia versus Alzheimer's patients? Um, I'm not sure if Dr. Smith or Dr. Milky or Dr. Goldberg or one of the others would like to answer. My advice is, tends to be the same, and um, it might expand um, depending upon where the person is within their diagnosis on that spectrum, you know, and then also um, I'm very open with sharing my caregiver journey as well, and I think that that helps. Um, but usually, you know, are you, I ask questions, are you listened to? Do we need to um, help find um, a different care partner in, in that patient's caregiving trajectory? And then um, also, I always connect folks to our social work team within the Night ADRC. Um, and so that's the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center at WashU. Um, and then, um, and even for me, our social work team at WashU has been very supportive of connecting me to other resources as well. So, Billion, can I can I jump in here uh, really quickly to the panelist point? Um, what I've experienced over the past twenty some odd years is that we operate in silos. So you have the medical practice, it's practicing under the medical model. You have the community advocates and the social workers are operating under that social model and the information is not being shared. We do not have a comprehensive care practice overall. And so people are not monolithic. People with Alzheimer's and dementia certainly are not monolithic. And so they're multi-layered and so their services support and communication should be multi-layered as well the jargon that's used is not understood by family members and caregivers so we think about the health literacy the health literacy area and so as a geriatric care manager i ensure to uh ensure to ensure that family caregivers understand what the doctor is saying and to dr barry's point don't talk over the person with Alzheimer's or dementia because they can hear and they can see. I don't know what we don't understand about that. They can hear, they can see, they're very attuned to nonverbal communication. And so once we listen to what they have to say and how they're feeling being person-centered, that whole person-centered approach should be threaded throughout all models of care. And so somebody, some people have to take the responsibility to ensure that the services are integrated and also comprehensive and also that families are considered a part of the team family caregivers they're the care partner to dr barry's point a lot of times it's either one way or the next either you focusing on the patient and not even considering the caregiver who is typically the invisible patient because if their natural support isn't healthy then they're not going to receive the person with dementia is not going to receive optimal care and so that is a big disparity that is a big breakdown that is a huge gap and it's been that way for years 
Yeah, I, everything Dr. Smith, Dr. Barry are saying are a hundred percent. Really need to streamline care, and there's a couple places. I mean, across the country, there are places like WashU has you know a great program and everything. Um, in Virginia, you know, there's one place called the University of Virginia Memory and Aging Care Clinic, which you know it's a collaboration of you know neuropsychologists, physicians, social work. It's a team that involves everybody. Primary care alone can't you know unless and there's very good primary care out there, but primary care by itself um, needs support from other services. And I you know, have to say, as a hospitalist, so I work specifically in the hospital. There's only so much I can do. Um, you know, when I have a patient who has Alzheimer's, I try to call the family and get a baseline. Say, what is this person at baseline? Are they someone who really has no idea what's going on, or is this someone who's actually oriented most of the time and gets a little bit confused? You know, at night. So I have a baseline. So if someone is way off, I'm like, oh, this is you know, is this delirium? Is there something else going on? Um, so involving the family is really important in the hospital. Um, but, you know, social work, you know, I feel like I'm always, they're, I'm, they're a huge part of, they're the ones who are able to provide, help connect people to services. They'll ask me and I'm like, let me talk to social work. You know, I can tell them about the Alzheimer's Association or I can tell them about HFC. Um, but the problem is one of the biggest things I see is, you know, it's not that they need medical care at home. It's they need something called custodial care or like, non-medical care and that's most of the time not covered by health insurance it's usually out of pocket or if you have long-term care insurance um, or if you're in a, a nursing facility sometimes that's included in your medical care and you know dr smith can probably tell tell you a lot more about that but you know my goal is eventually like to i would love to turn to my social to a social worker i'm working with and say you know what resources can we give to this family um because a lot of times uh it's, it's really hard. It's a lot of times it's coming out of their own pocket uh, and it can be really challenging. And to your point, um, Dr. Goldberg, you, as a hospitalist, you, you are one of the exceptions. Cause I'll tell you straight up what I tell my families, I said, try to avoid going to the hospital as much as you can. Cause you have hospitalists there and the doctor, they don't know the person. I tell families all the time, you know your loved one way better than any physician does. Stop putting all the responsibility on the physicians. But at the same time, I hold the physicians responsible too. To Dr. Barry's point here in South Carolina and across the country, there are more geriatric patients than there are geriatric physicians or geriatricians. And so what, what families are seeing, they're seeing a general practitioner. And so they're treating a specialized population as they treat a general population. And we know that some of the treatment is not ideal for the geriatric population to your point in terms of the resources. A lot of time the resources are coming out of families' pockets. And so I'll have families come to me and say, okay, they got a little bit of something, something, right? Um, too much to qualify for Medicaid, but not enough to pay for in-home care or other long-term care settings. And so we have to do some serious planning. When you help to someone to build um, a senior care team or a geriatric team, there are key players that have to be on there. And one is an elder attorney. An elder attorney can help with that Medicaid planning. Another is a geriatric care manager. They're going to get in the weeds and connect those medical services to the social support services. You got to use the Alzheimer's Association. You have to use other nonprofit organizations and state agency. Every state has a department on aging. Every state has um, community uh, area agencies on aging that helps with vouchers and grants. The problem is, it's so many resources out there, too much information is just as bad as not enough information at all. And so if, if any of us is going to touch a ger the geriatric population or a senior, we have to build our own knowledge and build a repository of resources so, so that way we can be a, so a true support to individuals who are living with dementia. One of the worst things I hate to do is give a family a number for them to get another number, to get another number. When I give them a resource, they're gonna talk to the person. I'm gonna tell them exactly what jargon to use. One um, term we talk about a lot is respite, respite care to Dr. Barry's point. You gotta take a break. You gotta be able to take care of yourself, but I would have some caregivers that they can't pronounce the word too well. And so they will call and ask for respite. And you know what the, uh, the person on the other end will say? Oh, we don't have that. You know what they're talking about. And so I tell families exactly what to say and what to expect. And Dr. Barry, if they don't get what they're supposed to get, you know what I tell them? 
call me because you know I'm not opposed to calling the governor because I do that stuff. You know, it's um, it, it's true. So I'll give you a really good example because I'm a I'm a storyteller by nature. So when I moved back to St. Louis from Minnesota and my mom was having some other health concerns, we're doing construction in my house. So hopefully you all won't hear um, too many drills and nail guns and stuff going on. Um, but anyway, um, when I first moved back to St. Louis from Minnesota um, and I took my mom for a visit with her primary care physician, who is an internal medicine physician. And, but his training was not in geriatrics, you know, his training was in one that fit one season of my parents' lives, right? But now that things have changed, the care that can be provided from that particular care team was very different than what she needed as a patient. And that's why they have specialties, that's why they have subspecialties, that's why they have fellowships. And I'm first to say, I am not a physician. However, um, I believe in health literacy, I believe in research literacy, and I believe that you have, we have power to ask our care teams any questions that we want to ask, you know, anything. And then we also have the responsibility of not being embarrassed when there's something that might be off, to come with our whole selves to those appointments and and ask the questions and if we feel like we're not getting the answer so with this particular uh provider um it was just a lot going on he had COVID patients and all of this other stuff happening and I hadn't been really pleased before because he was also my dad's physician and my father had passed and every time I would take my dad to the office before he passed from cancer the doctor would look at my brother and give responses and I'm the one asking the questions. And so that meant that I wasn't respected as a member of my father's caregiving team as, as, as a support person. And I told my brother, I said, we need to change doctors. He's like, oh no, Joy, you know, it'll be fine. So fast forward, almost five, four and a half, almost five years later, same physician caring for my, oh, he's great. We go into the office and I said, well, she needs um, a hearing test. She needs her eye exam. She needs referrals for X, Y, and Z. None of the referrals happened. Do you know how I got the referrals to happen? Was I called my colleagues who were physicians, who were with the Alzheimer's Association. And that's, I shouldn't have to do that. I should be able to say, I need X, Y, and Z. And, and I run a, 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 a research program, a multi-million dollar research program in aging. So if I'm not getting the, the access that I need working in the industry, then what's happening to the other patients in terms of access? And then Dr. Smith mentioned silos. And those silos happen. Like I just did a search for what we have in Missouri, like five different agencies popped up and each of them have a different 1-800 number. I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating just slightly, but not really. And then when you call those numbers, because we've been going through this with my mom, trying to get some additional support for like light housekeeping and things like that. And her insurance will cover some of it, but she has too much money to qualify for Medicaid. So someone said, oh, well, one attorney I spoke to said, well, you need to spend down some things or sell some of her assets. We're not doing that. That, me that impacts the, the wealth building that she and my father have done for my brother and me and my brother's child and whenever my husband and I decide to have kids. So why would we do those things? So it ends up being this push-pull, and I think about this when I do research as well, how do we change what I don't, one of my faculty members said that we don't have a healthcare system in the US, we have a healthcare arena. A colleague of, Mich of Dr. Milky's and ours just passed named Aaron Lepine. Aaron used to say that our system was a, um, what did he call it? Was a sick care system which basically means you get sick, 
we, we get sick, we go to the doctor, we get a Band-Aid, we get the medicine we need, we get the therapies that we need or the devices that we need. But then afterwards, or even prior, we don't talk about well care. What can we do to stay well? Um, and, you know, and that goes back to quality of life, that goes back to access, it goes back to equity. It's a lot of factors that aren't, often aren't considered when we're thinking about person-centered care. So. So uh, one thing, just to, to take a, a little bit of a trajectory and, and to get back to kind of some of the sex and, and gender differences, th there is um, a building body of research thinking about um, the, the sex of the caregiver um, and also whether it's, you know, a spouse versus a child versus a paid caregiver or, you know, because caregivers can come in, in a lot of different ways. And it, it's something that hasn't, um, it, you know, really hit in terms of clinical implications or, or thoughts on that regard. But, you know, if you, if you think about it, particularly the generation that are, are at greater risk of dementia now, I mean, I, I know my grandfather would not necessarily be able to take care of my grandmother. Um, he wouldn't know how to cook. And so, you know, there, there's some of these factors as well that are important to consider, but really, I mean, the research is, is just happening now and, and kind of the best ways to strategize around that. And, and of course, there's also different relationships, uh, sons, daughters, daughter-in-laws, son-in-laws, and, and those types of things too. So um, again, it's something that needs to be considered, but in, in terms of the question, we're just not there yet. So I'll build upon your response. We have a question that says, um, is having the same care caregiver over the process of therapy would be more helpful impact on the dementia? Um, so sorry, it would having like the same person take care of the individual member um, be better than just having um, a lot of different people take care of the caregiver? My answer to that would be, would be twofold. For someone who has a progressive type of dementia or Alzheimer's disease, consistency is key. Consistency is key because they establish a bond, a relationship, a trust with that person, their energy. And so it's ideal to have consistency. Now, one person is going to wear them down because when you're caring for someone with Alzheimer's and dementia, that's 25, eight, right? Um, so having a consistent team would be most ideal. And when I say team, a lot of times I have to go in and do uh, uh, family dynamics uh, training because you have to divide the roles up. You have to divide the responsibilities up. One family member or friend or person may handle the finances. Another one may handle the ADLs, activities of daily living. Another person might be the companion. I know I'll be the companion because I talk all the time. And so that's that engagement piece. And so I feel that it needs to be a small number of people. It depends on the, the situation. Uh, it could be two or three. It definitely should be not 10. It's too stimulating. It's too overwhelming. It could definitely cause agitation. And so having consistency in a small group of caregivers would be my recommendation. Yeah, and similar, you know, to what Dr. Barry was talking about before too, like having an advocate, like if you're, if you're the primary caregiver, you know, who's responsible for kind of knowing the overall health and everything of, of the, the family member, like you, that is the biggest ally, that's the biggest thing you can do for your loved one is, you go to the doctor and you're like, this is what's going on. I'm telling you, this is how, you know, my father or grandfather typically acts, something's off or, you know, I need help with this. And being an advocate for family is something that um, is really important. But yeah, having that support system for the caregiver is, is, is crucial as well. Like uh, Dr. Smith was saying. Awesome. We'll dive into some individ individual questions we received. Um, so this one is for Dr. Melky. What are you most looking forward to in the next decade within Alzheimer's research? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I guess how, how much it will advance. So, you know, with a lot of things right now, um, even with the sex and gender aspects, I feel like we're, we're just getting started. 
and th there's a lot more recognition out there and a lot more people that are interested in it and and as a result i think there's going to be a lot more research and a lot more guidance down the road um e you know even in terms of the the work i do with uh blood-based biomarkers you know we, we finally have the technology to measure some of these things in the blood um we, we still have to figure out appropriate context of use and and all these things but 10 years down the road, it's possible we'll, we'll have something for screening and diagnosis probably earlier than that. So it, it is really amazing. Um, you know, treatments are, are still not quite there yet, uh, but we, we are finally moving in that direction and, and historically have been behind cardiovascular disease and cancer and, and a lot of these other fields. Um, but right now is a, a really exciting time. So, so the, was there a time frame on when we like to see something happen? Um, I would love to see there be a cure, right? Um, and which is when we think about prevention, we talk about it in terms of primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. Time, primary is before a disease um, takes place, before we even notice a change. Um, secondary, we've been exposed or are at risk for, um, for a health condition. And then tertiary, we already have it and we're either managing it or going toward that palliative care phase, wherever that might be. And I would love to see something happen, you know, for people that are 20 years old and, and 30, because we there's some literature, not much, that talks about the earlier onset and things like subjective um, cognitive decline, where I feel like there's something going on with me cognitively, but no one is really listening to me and I'm not on the dementia spectrum. And so when we think about it like that, I would love to see something happen where we're doing more for chronic disease prevention. Um, and that's around thinking about structural vulnerabilities, um, social determinants of health, um, the things that we cannot necessarily change, but even knowing our um, genetic risk factors and heredity, so fam familiar risk for different diseases and why certain screening is very important. Um, because when we look at chronic health conditions like Alzheimer's disease and cancer, um, many of those link back to vascular dementia, vascular disease. So like hypertension and also in, the, the diseases of the endocrine system. So I would love to see there being a cure. I would love for there to be um, earlier biomarker tests. If they're, you know, like other blood tests, I know that Precivity AD is now a new drug, a new, um, not drug, a new uh, biomarker test is a blood draw um, that looks for certain um, things on the Alzheimer's spectrum. I'm not a physician, so I won't speak too much about that. But I do know that, um, that we would love to see a cure and better treatment for those that, that have it. And that's accessible to everyone. Not, and that goes back to justice. Awesome, we'll do another individual question. This one's for um, Dr. Smith. They write, it's clear that you have years upon years of experience working with the aging and vulnerable populations. National Alzheimer's Buddies volunteers want to provide emotional support that you describe in your letter to the editor. What specific tips can you share with us on how National Alzheimer's Buddies volunteers can better support their buddies? Thank you, Jillian. That's an excellent question. Um, so my passion is educating and training and building future gerontologist, uh, one of the things that I, I harp on a lot is better understanding and knowing who the person was prior to the disease process. That's going to help you build that engagement piece. And so I would tell students, do like real research and figure out who the person was. When were they born? Where were they born? What are they like? What do they like? What are their likes? What are their desires? And that's going to help prepare and prime your students to be able to have meaningful engagement with the, the person who's living with dementia. In fact, they may only just ask one question or mention something that's going to trigger a memory that's going to allow that person to be independent in storytelling and telling their story. And so 
that is one key that I would uh, try to hone in on and drill down is to do your research about who the person was prior to the disease process, because they're still that person. Just the way they respond and engage is different, but it's still here. That's one thing that never changes, no matter how far the person has journeyed in their disease, their heart and their soul is still there. And that's why person-centered care is at the core of dementia-capable care. So better understanding and knowing who they were prior to the disease process. Thank you for that answer. And Dr. Goldberg, we have a question for you. Given your experience as a physician and as an active member for Alzheimer's Association, what interconnections do you see amongst hospital life and volunteering? Uh, great, that's a good question. So, um, so I, I kind of mentioned what I do as a hospitalist and how in some ways, aside from trying to prevent delirium, getting a baseline mental status and talking with social work, I don't feel like there's a whole lot I can do um, specifically for this person who has Alzheimer's. And it's, it's kind of makes you feel helpless sometimes. Um, and so that's where, you know, my colleagues in social work um, really come through for our patients. Um, so that's why I, I do work with um, the Alzheimer's Association. That's why I do work with HFC. You know, the Alzheimer's Association has so many great resources and connections for caregivers um, and HFC, you know, that it's, it's, you know, it's a, for those who don't know, it's an organization founded by Seth Rogen and his wife, Laura Miller Rogen, um, and they just do great work. They really focus on the millennial, uh, you know, the millennial generation, Gen Z generation, trying to get everybody who's younger to, to kind of take brain health seriously. Um, and they just do such a great work um, that I, you know, want, I volunteer my time to work with them because I want to be able to, you um, be able to give more to my patients and to my friends whose parents have early onset than just, you know, hey, you should call, you know, this number and maybe they can help you out. Um, and advocacy, I think, is really important because, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And so um, in the last 10 years, when I first started doing Alzheimer's advocacy, I think the federal budget for Alzheimer's was less than half a billion dollars or about half a billion dollars. Which in the whole, which may sound like a lot of money, but in the whole scheme of everything, that's that's not. Um, and in the last 10 years, like I've said, it's it's one of the few issues that's bipartisan, and it's uh, you know I think now they're at 3.1 billion dollars. I think is about what the NIH um, uh, funding is for for Alzheimer's, uh, and so you have to keep fighting for that every. I mean every year you know I, I speak with um, you know my congressman, I speak with my senator, I speak. The state legislature is also really important. Your local community is really important. And I try to use um, my privilege as a physician to try to push for these things that will help uh, families um, living with Alzheimer's. Awesome. We have one more question from the audience. Um, it says, what are we doing to navigate cultural burials in Alzheimer's disease and caregiving for men, especially from conservative patriarchal backgrounds? That's a, a great question, and, and you know, as I mentioned before, we're th there isn't enough work right now understanding some of these gender differences and and gender roles. Um, I, I don't think, and and it, you know, others can answer in, in terms of their thoughts and, and interactions from a caregiver uh, perspective, but I, I don't think um, you know, in general, that that's even necessarily thought of. Thank you for that response. And then we have another question that came up in the chat for Dr. Smith. Um, she asked, what does a family member do if they feel like their loved one is not ready for an Alzheimer's unit? Do you believe some patients go in too soon? I would say you definitely, you definitely have to have that conversation with the, the team, right? If the person is currently living in an assisted living, because dementia care is a part of the assisted living model. It, it, appears to, it, it appears to align better with nursing home, but it's a part of the assisted living model. And so if the person is living in assisted living, I would advise to have a, a team meeting with the, the higher ups at that assisted living 
And also you want to include uh, the folks who are practicing or performing the ADL. So the people who are providing the hands-on care need to be a part of the team because they have information that they can share that will help make a decision. And so I, will, I would advise family members to have a conversation with the decision makers, but also the direct support caregivers who are providing care to that loved one. Um, if the individual is living at home, I would advise family members to make contact with a geriatric care manager. Um, aginglifecare.org is a website. You can go on to search geriatric care managers in your area because they can help um, navigate that whole system in terms of care. I've actually had to create an individualized uh, residential care plan for individuals who have mild cognitive impairment or early stage uh, dementia. They weren't quite ready for uh, the Alzheimer's community but they needed a little bit more care in the assisted living. So we created something specific for them because it is actually individualized care. Um, and Jillian, before we get out of here, I want to uh, put in my um, email address if anybody wants to make contact with me. And that is info at dtconsultant.org. Info at dtconsultant.org. I do free consultations. I also do uh, virtual consultations because family members are kind of in different states. And so by the power of technology, the new type of caring and caregiving, we can connect various um, components into one. So feel free to reach out to me. I am also on social media and I do answer my inboxes as well. So I hope I answered, answered the question. Awesome. Yeah, I know we're going a little bit over, so I'll just ask a final question for all of you to answer. Um, I know our volunteers are going to be the future for Alzheimer's disease, making a difference. They'll be the leading researchers, physicians, and caregivers. Um, what advice do you have for our volunteers and maybe per speaking from personal experience, how you got to where you are today and just any advice you have for our college students? Jillian, I'm, I'm going to go first because I have to get out of here. Uh, one thing I tell my students, I tell my families, and always when I'm doing professional development, focus on the person, not the condition. If they're having behavioral responses, because I don't say problematic behavior, if they're having behavioral responses, focus on the cause, not the condition. And so that's definitely what, what I will leave you here with today. And how I got to where I am is the fact that I, pers I focus on the person, to Dr. Barry's point. I focus on the person because they tell you what they need, even if it's through behaviors. They're telling you what they need and what they desire. And that's our responsibility to listen. Thank you all so much for being here and for having me. Thank you so much, Jill. Thank you for being here. So if, I guess thinking about it from a career, you know, research or whatnot standpoint, um, number one, I would say keep following your passion. There's going to be ups and downs. There are always roadblocks. You can get kind of, you can end up going down another path and, and still stay in Alzheimer's disease or, or gerontology or another um, related discipline. But um, keep your head up and, and keep going. Um, it just like with, with caregivers, you, you, there's going to be bumps in the road and it's going to be difficult. Um, find somebody that you can lean on certainly to take care of yourself, um, but follow your passion and, and it, you'll get there. So I'll leave you with this. Um, definitely follow your passion, know what you love as my colleagues have mentioned, but I'll leave you with this. Take care of your whole self first. Um, and that means your spiritual, your physical, and your mental and emotional health. Um, make time to go outside, make time to read a good book or listen to some music, and then be okay if mistakes happen and I call that failing forward. So we must fail forward in order to find success along the path, whatever that path might take us. So. This is all really great advice. And uh, I would also say, you know, um, you're not alone. I think part of uh, what's hard about being, you know, when you're in your early twenties and you're you know, dealing with loved one who has Alzheimer's, you can feel alone. And now I think people talk about it more, but there's so many great organizations out there. Um, and then, 
you know, not giving up, like being persistent just because someone tells you no, if you want to, you know, do something with Alzheimer's or work with an organization, you can always ask again another time, work with another organization. Um, and, or if you're talking with a, you know, your representative or your senator and they're like, oh, we just don't have it in the budget. It's like, well, you need to make this part of the budget um, and be persistent. And um, sometimes you're gonna get results that you aren't happy with, but um, overall, if you keep trying, um, you know, you'll be able to, to reach your goals. Awesome, thank you guys so much. That was a really powerful discussion. Unfortunately, we didn't get the chance to answer a few questions. I don't know if you guys would like to just put um, your emails in the chat that we can share with our audience members and they might be able to email you guys directly if that works. Awesome, so thanks again for being a part of our really powerful discussion. Um, we were now gonna move on to a, the family testimonials. So um, last year we heard from a family testimonial from Dr. Richie Sanchez and Andy Sanchez. Unfortunately, they're unable to join us today. They are participating in the Houston Walk to End Alzheimer's Disease. Um, for those of you who don't know their background, um, Dr. Richie Sanchez was diagnosed with younger onset Alzheimer's disease at the age of 56. Um, and over the past two years, they've been using their platform um, to bring awareness to the disease. So we just wanted to provide our audience with an update on them. So we'll share a brief video. I am fortunate that I get to speak to many people about Alzheimer's. And lots of times I hear, you don't look like you have dementia. I usually just say, thank you. But what does Alzheimer's look like? Well, quite frankly, it changes. Even though it may sound trite, there are good days and not so good days. But for me today, I'm a wife, a mom, a Texas A&M Aggie mom, Gig'em, a Baylor Bear mom, Sick'em Bears, a daughter-in-law, a mentor, a friend, and yes, I'm usually the tall one, a woodworker, and lifelong University of Houston Cougar fan, go Cougs, a scholar, heck, I'm even a certified barbecue judge. I had a wonderful and fulfilling 24-year career in healthcare, and I love the beach. The ocean is always renewing. Each wave brings new possibilities. It never stops, and neither will I. I love and loved being all of those things. And yes, I'm also a younger onset Alzheimer's disease patient. But for us, what was yesterday and what is today walk hand in hand, neither canceling the other. Alzheimer's is the sixth leading cause of death in the United States, and the only one in the top 10, other than accidents, that does not have a cure cannot be prevented or even slowed down. As of today, we have no medications to stave off its insidious nature, but we can conquer this. We're closer than we've ever been. It was in the summer of 2018, and I could sense that my short-term memory and my ability to learn new things at work were not quite the same. As the chief operating officer of a hospital that was recognized as one of the elite hospitals in the nation, I absolutely needed to be on my A-game every day. However, by the fall of 2019, imaging confirmed that my wife had younger onset Alzheimer's disease, a rare form of Alzheimer's that affects adults younger than 65 and comprises only 5% of all Alzheimer's patients. I was 56 at that time, and my career was over. Suddenly, our future looked very different. Our retirement was not going to be the retirement that we planned for and dreamed of. I'll admit, the diagnosis knocked me down. It knocked me down too. But getting knocked down is not defeat. Not getting up is defeat. But I'm up now. And I'm up with you. I always thought that after my career in healthcare, I'd like an opportunity to teach my dissertation topic, patient-centered care. I still have that same vision, but now it's bigger than I imagined because I'll get to reach more people. 
Yes, I'll still get to teach, but I won't be confined to a classroom standing behind a lectern. I'll get to teach patient-centered care not as a research scientist, but from a different perspective, as a patient. So, although I no longer have an executive healthcare position, I now have an executive healthcare mission to fight for as long as I can, and with your help, win this worldwide battle against Alzheimer's disease. Only research will lead to the first survivor, and that discovery and research can only happen through awareness, advocacy, and action. So let's be strong and unwavering in our collective endeavor to combat this dreadful disease. Medications that could possibly extend the quality of life for Alzheimer's patients, which directly affects their care partners and their loved ones, are potentially just around the corner. So please, join us on this journey. And join us in this fight. I don't want to be someone just sitting around with the disease. I get up every day ready to battle because I have reason to hope that breakthroughs are within our reach so that we will have that first white flower, the first Alzheimer's survivor. Perhaps that first survivor will be your mother or your father. It could be your brother, your sister, or your best friend. Or maybe, just maybe, it'll be you. Um, so that was a very powerful video from our um, family friends, the Sanchez family. Um, so for those of you who don't know, November is Alzheimer's Awareness Month. Um, so Alzheimer's Buddies, along with Alzheimer's Association, are joining the cause and we want to raise awareness for Alzheimer's disease. So this month, National Alzheimer's Buddies will be launching our Forget Me Not campaign to bring awareness to the 5% of individuals diagnosed with younger onset awareness disease. Um, please follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Alls Buddies um, and sign up for our newsletter for more details to come. Um, we're very excited to launch this awareness campaign. So moving on, um, we are going to have our second panel, our roundtable discussion today, which will where we'll be hearing from caregivers, family members, and advocates discussing the impacts of Alzheimer's disease. We have three panelists today. Um, we have Chris, um, who is Life with Grams on social media. We have Roxanne, who is also known as Wilson and Grandpa on social media. And then we have Sherry Ballinger. Um, so I would like all of you to just briefly introduce yourselves um, and tell our audience a little bit, a bit about you guys. Sorry, this is my first time doing something like this. Am I on? <laughs> you are, yes. Yep. Okay, cool. Well, I'm Chris. I am the full-time caregiver for my grandmother, Mary. Um, she's lived with me since March of 2017. And we've just been kind of um, going through this journey together. So yeah, that's a little bit about me. Hello, everybody. Nice to meet you. My name is Roxanne, and I created Wilson and Grandpa last year. Um, this was in honor of my grandpa who passed away from Alzheimer's um, in October 2020. And we are a care and awareness project hoping to normalize the conversation in a simple way that everybody can understand. So thank you so much for the opportunity um, to be here. <laughs> And hi, hi everyone. Um, my name is Cherie Ballinger and uh, thank you to the National Alzheimer's Buddies Foundation Association for having me today. I've really been enjoying this entire <laughs> symposium today and it's been very interesting. Um, I am the US ambassador for the Women's Brain Project based in Switzerland and also an ambassador for the same U Foundation based in the UK. I'm also a traumatic brain injury survivor. And so this is very personal to me. And um, again, I've just really been enjoying the panelists, the doctors that we've had on this symposium thus far. So, and thank you. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you all for being a part of um, today's discussion. So we'll start off with some general questions um, similar to the first panel. Feel free to tackle it, whoever wants to take on the question. Um, but for our social media 
individuals, how has documenting the process of caring for your loved one helped you? Uh, for me personally, it has changed my whole aspect on caregiving. Um, it's given me um, friendships. It's given me support. It's given me an understanding that even I had no idea was out there. <laughs> um, I've really, everything I've learned about this disease has pretty much been through social media. Um, so in sharing our journey, now that I feel confident in my role as a caregiver over these last five years, being able to hear from other caregivers saying, wow, that helped me, or I learned so much from just seeing your grandma and you interact and different things like that has really changed my whole world. And it has created this whole environment that I did not expect. So I am very fortunate that uh, I started posting <laughs> really, it's been, it's been amazing. For me, um, I was not a primary caregiver for my grandpa, but I saw it firsthand with my grandmother, how she cared for him and whatnot. And it made me realize, okay, there's so many resources out there, so many things available like therapy and, and support groups and all of that. And I wish um, I would have known about that. So my, I could assist my grandmother better, even though we took care of my grandpa the best way we could. And I've been able to connect with amazing people like Chris and learn so much um, from them. And hopefully um, I can bring all these resources together and help other people um, know what's available so they don't have to struggle as much or um, think that they're in this by themselves. So this is, it's, it's been a, an amazing experience, not only healing um, from the loss of my grandpa, but also being able to connect with so many people that help us learn so much. So that's been a great experience. Awesome. Building off of that, um, what is something that you guys have learned working with Alzheimer's disease that you wish you had known earlier? And what is something that you would like to share with the audience? For me, um, definitely in those earlier stages, I didn't realize what exactly Alzheimer's was. I was pretty much going in it unknown, just knowing that older adults get it and different things like that. I didn't realize how it can affect so many other people. Um, so for me, my biggest takeaway that I've learned in sharing my journey on social media is patience um, and not having to correct. Um, living in my grandma's world and living where my grandma is has been the most helpful thing on this journey. Um, there's no need to try to teach her how to do things the right way anymore. You know, it's just kind of learning to embrace where she at is or where she's at and um, really developing on who she is now and the different stages that she enters. So um, patience is definitely number one. And then really just entering their world. That's, that's been the most helpful. For me, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> so I was just going to say that for a lot of people that don't know much about Alzheimer's, like I didn't, um, it's, it's so much more than losing memories. It's so much more to affect your life in so many ways, your loved ones, people caring for them. So it's just keeping in mind that your loved one living with Alzheimer's are worthy of dignity, privacy, respect. And it's our responsibility to make sure that they feel validated and that we don't embarrass them and being their support, um, regardless if they're the primary caregiver or not, it's, it's really our duty to ensure that they, again, they feel validated and, and we care for them as best as we can. And remember that there's still people with feelings that can hear, that uh, have a voice. So ensure that, that we are giving them, being the voice for them, if that makes sense. <laughs> So we um, got an individual question for Sherry. Um, as a passionate advocate yourself, what are some small ways that others such as students can get involved in this initiative? Well, you know, what actually really attracted me to your organization is it's the compassion and empathy aspects because just as they just mentioned, you have to remember that every person has their dignity, they're, they're human beings and um, I feel like sometimes we get so caught up in the science and in the advocacy and in the research. And I know like, you know, especially with the Women's Brain Project, there's so many wonderful things going on right now. So much wonderful research happening. 
But what I love about the Alzheimer's Buddies Association is that human element, that compassion and empathy aspect. And I feel like you guys really are the answer for young people, for college students. And I think that it doesn't, it doesn't just help the Alzheimer's patients, but it also helps the college students. I think that it goes both ways. It's a win-win. So I think that you guys are actually the answer to that question. And also too, I just want to point out that, you know, um, and this was discussed earlier today, that there's a lot of early onset Alzheimer's. And I know that with the Women's Brain Project, we have an ambassador named Sophia Peterson, and she had early onset in her 40s. And that's quite, I mean, that's quite young for that. And we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of that now. And so we have to just remember, th these are people's lives. Th these are their lives. And having the compassion and remembering that everyone is going through something, right? So I think that the Alzheimer's Buddies Association is the answer to that especially for young people. I think it helps both sides of the aisle. And I love what you guys are doing. And that's why I'm so excited to be a part of this today because I feel like the more people know about your association, the better, because the more people get involved, the more advocacy and also the more talking about it that we do, that's where the change happens. The more we talk about it, the better. Awesome, I love that. Building on that response, um, how can young people contribute to the fight against Alzheimer's disease? Anyone feel free to tackle that question. I just feel staying educated. Um, now that social media is such a big thing, um, that's what I love about sharing our journey is that I talk to so many people regularly on a daily basis that don't know anything about this disease. Um, and so the more, like, like um, she had just said that the more we talk about it, the better it is. Um, it's great for young people to get involved, go to those organizations, go to the walks, go just find more information out. I always tell all my TikTok viewers that it's projected that by 2050, the number of cases of Alzheimer's is set to double. So if you don't know someone now, you most likely will know someone with this disease. So it's best to get educated beforehand. I know that as me as a full-time caregiver, when I first started, I didn't have a clue. And so even just knowing those small things to look for, um, my grandma was well into the mid stages when she was diagnosed because she had lived alone. We all lived in different states. No one really was watching the things that were happening on a regular basis for her. And so if we had no, if I had known just a little bit more about this disease, if it was a little bit more commonly spoken about and not just in the negative light of memory loss, I might've known like, wow, Graham called me 72 times on Saturday. Like maybe that would have like clicked or something. So I just think really getting out there and, and learning what you can, because even if you're not affected now, I do believe that one day, Unfortunately, this disease will get to someone that you know. Well, I think young people can contribute in many ways to fight this disease, uh, whether it's by taking the medical or science route to treat uh, or study the disease a little bit more um, so we can have more advances towards a cure. I think it's important to normalize the conversation and spread awareness of Alzheimer's, of course. Uh, people need to understand um, how urgent it is that we prioritize this disease um, to eradicate the, the Alzheimer's. And not only um, some more people can enjoy their lives to the fullest, but we already see what it's like. So it's also for our future, like Chris mentioned too, like at some point we're all gonna be faced by this and, and we cannot accept that. Uh, we need to take action now and using social media, joining clubs or something like that to, to normalize that conversation. It's, it's very important and, and young people, like we have the resources out there. We just need to ensure people know what to talk about and, and make it normal. Awesome. So we received a personal question for Chris. So how did you make the decisions to take care of Mary at home? What were some considerations that went into it? And I should just add, Mary is um, Chris's grandmother. Yeah. So for us, like I had mentioned earlier, my grandma was well into the mid stages um, when she was diagnosed. 
So by the time that we had all this information laid out in front of us, we didn't really know what to do. Um, my family came to a decision together to put her in assisted living because we felt that that was where she needed to be. We didn't want her to be home alone anymore where she could wander or leave the house like she had when we got her diagnosed. Um, and this is just our story. I know everyone's story is different, but what I saw, my grandma's talking in the back to her baby, sorry. <laughs> but what I saw um, my grandma go through in those three months in the nursing home, um, I just felt like I could provide a quality of life for her that was more, that she could get more out of life. She went from driving her car in 2015 to now being in an assisted live-in in 2016. And it just was very hard to kind of wrap myself around that. Um, some of the things that went into it, obviously we had a big family discussion. I'm the only one in the family, not married without kids. And so it just felt, um, like why not? I was 29 years old. I had an extra room available in my apartment. And the questions that I really just asked myself was, can I do this? Am I capable of doing this. And I said, if my friends are all having kids and they're capable of doing that, then I can take care of my grandma. Um, and it was really just kind of a trial and error in the beginning. I just, I wanted to give her more. I didn't think that she was ready for, um, the assisted living yet. You know, I felt like there had to be maybe a little bit more to give her a little more quality of life. Um, so yeah, it was just taking a look at my life and what I could provide for her and how I could do that safely and in the best way possible. Um, and now five years later, I'm so glad I took a chance. I'm so glad I listened to my gut and said, I can provide, I can give her a good life because unfortunately she lost like 30 pounds in those first three months. And she just was so unhappy and in my family, it's always, I'm the baby of the family. So it's always known that I was the favorite. <laughs> so it just, it was an easy transition for me really to um, consider taking that role on for my grandma. She did everything for me. So it's just kind of returning the favor um, back for her now. Awesome. Um, Sherry, we have a question for you and then others feel free to answer this. Um, how can we start a conversation about Alzheimer's disease and help to normalize the conversation? I think that you can start by giving the statistics. So just a few statistics to share, you know, one in three people will be affected by acquired brain injury. And when you think about that and how people with brain injuries or any kind of head trauma will always be more susceptible to Alzheimer's, that's a lot of people. And you combine that with the fact that every one of us is going to get old. You just cannot, you cannot run away from that, right? It's going to happen. And so it affects actually all of us, whether we ourselves get Alzheimer's or not, you're going to have someone close to you who has it. And so it is so crucial that we continue talking about Alzheimer's. We talk about the statistics. Um, again, I know I keep going to back to the Women's Brain Project, but they're doing so much research right now on precision medicine and how we can prevent, diagnose, and treat based on our sex and gender differences. So men and women are very different in how we how we, how, how we deal with everything, right? So for me, I had a traumatic brain injury and I had so many female specific symptoms and issues following my brain injury. And I was down for four years. I had four years of recovery. It was horrific. Um, my family, you know, I was incredibly blessed that I had them to take care of me, which is why, I mean, I applaud the two of you here. You're talking about your caregiving roles. It, it is so crucial to have you guys and to have people with such big hearts and compassion because we're all human. We all go through things. So it's my roundabout way of answering the question, but you know, we have to talk about it. I always go back to that. We have to talk about it, talk about how it affects all of us. That's why this is so important. And there is a lot of strides made right now. I mean, just from when I had my injury in 2014, um, to now, there have been so many strides in research made. Um, and I just want to give a quick shout out because we're having a um, seminar on November 19th with the Women's Brain Project. It's going to be international. Everyone here is welcome to join that. And please do. 
because the more we all can collaborate, talk, share from our all of our own different perspectives, the more we can make headway into this. But also, again, it's that personal link, that hu human link. It, it's having the love and compassion for the dignity of every person, whether that's your grandmother, your grandfather, your friend, the, the, the lonely old person at the, at the home who doesn't have anyone. I, I mean, I feel the most for people like that. What about those people? They don't even know, they don't remember anything about their lives and they're, they're alone. I mean, my heart just breaks when I think about the people living with Alzheimer's right now who have no one. We have to advocate for people like that. So we have to talk about it, share the statistics, get involved. And um, today's symposium is such a beautiful start to doing that. Awesome. We have an individual question that came in for Roxanne. Um, what words of wisdom can you offer for those that are taking care of a family member with dementia? I just, I think you're muted. You might just have to unmute yourself. <laughs> can you hear me now? <laughs> um, I think, again, I was not a primary caregiver um, for my, gran my grandpa, but I'm seeing it, with, I saw it with my grandmother, I see it with caregivers um, that I've connected with. And I think it's just important to remember that your well-being it's just as important as the well-being of your loved one. So I know, I, I believe Dr. Barry talk, uh, touched on this earlier, but it's just so important for, for the caregiver to know that you need to take care of yourself. There's so many resources out there available for you and you need to help others uh, help you take care of yourself. Um, because of course, when you take care of yourself, you will be even a better caregiver to your loved one. And I guess prioritizing that mental health and ensuring that you are okay, um, it, it's going to take you um, in a better caregiving journey. Um, I know with my grandma, she will feel guilty to live in like just going out for a couple hours to get something to eat with us. Like she will feel so guilty. Oh my God, what is, is going to happen? And she had people that she would rely on that knew what they were doing too. But even that, like, I guess she created like some dependence on even on my grandpa that she couldn't be without him at any moment. And we were like, like, okay, come on, like come with us, just take a break for you. And it was very difficult for her to take that step. So again, take care of yourself, help us take care of you. Um, and, and yeah, m m mental health, everything that's very important. Awesome, thank you guys. So we'll um, have our one final wrap up question um, that all of you can answer. Um, what is one piece of advice um, that you would give our volunteers and our um, audience members today that you wish um, someone had told you along the way? Um, for me personally, uh, I mentioned it earlier, but the patience aspect of it, just being patient and like Roxanne had said, taking care of yourself. Um, it's so, so, so important. Caregiver burnout is real and being there providing for another person constantly, you need to make sure that you are up there so you can provide the best level of care for them. Um, there are so many resources out there. There's so many things that you can learn from and do to keep educating yourself. Um, it's really extremely important that you are in your best health so you can provide the best health and um, really just understanding that you're not alone. I know when I started this journey, I didn't know where to go, where to look, what to do, and being able to find those resources. And, and another thing I'd like to add is that knowing one person with dementia is one person with dementia. I know that's a kind of popular quote, but it's very personalized. We're all individuals. You know, I think about me compared to my sister, we're in the same family, but we're two very different people. So when you're caring for someone with Alzheimer's or dementia, to really know things about them, about who they are, about what they like, about what they've enjoyed in their later or earlier years is really going to benefit them now, especially because I see my grandma, the way her mind is now, she thinks she's like 20 years old and she's ready to party and go out and have a good time. So I cater to that aspect of her. Whereas 
my great grandma who had Alzheimer's when I was taking care of her, she didn't have that. She was a very stern woman, you know, so she liked different things than my grandma does. And just because something works for one person, unfortunately, it doesn't mean it's going to work for you and your care partner. Um, so really, it's like, just keep trying, stay motivated and stay healthy. Um, I did want to add one more little thing about um, making the conversations out there, bringing the conversations out there. I've noticed that in a lot of my caregiver support groups with um, older generations, people are almost embarrassed of their family members with this disease. And I, that like saddens me. Um, I've know I've I've seen it in my own family as well. My grandma carries the baby doll around, so you know when you go out in public, get rid of that, get rid of that embarrassment, get rid of that anxiety. Um, understand the more comfortable you are with this disease, and the more comfortable you are with your loved one having this disease, the better the conversations are going to go. Instead of going out to eat or going to the store and hiding, you know, running away, you can say. I'm sorry, she has Alzheimer's, you know, and then maybe someone goes, oh, Alzheimer's, and then they might look it up or get in, involved. I just really feel that um, the shush, shush of our society, like, don't tell anyone she's got dementia, you know, like, I think that um, it needs to be spoken that and there are people like the video you showed earlier of the two, the, the wife and the husband that she's got, she's a mom, she's a mentor, she's doing all these things. They are still individual people. And um, yeah, I know I went on a bunch of tangents there, but lots of good stuff. So thank you again so much. I think you guys are muted. I don't know if either of you wanna say your final words and your final piece of advice. I was gonna say she wants to go first, right? <laughs> but I'm gonna mute it now, so I guess I'll go. I guess my um, advice, I guess, that I could give to the people in the community is to remember remember that you don't have to be the primary caregiver to make a difference in um, your loved one's life. Like, I was a granddaughter, and, you know, I, going there, spending time with him was um, a great way to cherish the memories with him. And you, again, you don't have to be the primary person over there to educate yourself and and to learn more about how you can help them. In my case, I didn't know much about Alzheimer's disease, but I know I would ask my grandma, like, hey, what does he like to do? Like, what does he like to eat? Like, I would try to get to know him as this version now. I guess I didn't know before how, how it worked. But again, uh, just check on people who are caring for someone, um, see how you can help them. Um, I know I've read so many times that you need, you can offer something specific to help them with. Oh, let me go grocery shopping for you or let me um, put the socks on for him, something like that. So any like the little things, it's like they can make a huge difference and you don't have to be necessarily with, be with them 24 seven. It's just even for a day or two, calling them, checking on them, it, it makes a huge difference. Yeah, you know, I so agree with that, with what both of you have just said. And um, you know what always comes to me is the quote, be kind to everyone because you don't know what they're going through. And whether that's the caregiver, whether that's the patient, whether that is someone in the wider circle, because that really encompasses everybody. And I love too what Chris just said, how, you know, don't, don't give in to, you know, being quiet about it and, and the stigma of things like that, that actually doesn't help at all. I mean, we, we it, have to talk about it. And I keep going back to that because it's just so important because the more we talk about it, the more other people will understand, they'll learn more. And the more we can be on the race to find the cure. And, and I'll also just say too, again, it's that humanity aspect of things, which is why I love the national Alzheimer's buddies. Because um, I think the more we spread awareness of programs like this one um, that could help people, you know, both sides of the aisle again, and then also other foundations like the CMU Foundation and the Women's Brain Project. And the more we talk about it, the more we can make strides, and we just have to remember that compassion element. And um, let's take away the stigma because I just, you know, just to close, you know, I remember when I had my, my TBI, I was so scared of people 
thinking, oh, you know, I don't want them to know I have a brain injury. So I, I was just silent. And then I just burst into tears randomly. And it was a, it was just a horrific, horrific years of recovery that I experienced that way. But if I had been more comfortable, like it was more known, oh, you know, I just feel like it would have been a different, a different kind of feeling for me and for my, my family, my mom in particular, who is my caregiver. So talking about it is crucial. Getting involved is crucial. And, um, yeah, you know what, just remembering, be kind to everyone because you don't know what someone's going through. Awesome. Thank you guys for this really powerful roundtable discussion. Um, feel free to link your social media in the chat. Um, so if people want to reach back out to you, um, we didn't get a chance to answer all the questions today, but I will send them all to you and you can follow up with them. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for participating today. Um, now we will hear from our second keynote speaker, Dan Gaspi, who is the co-founder of the B. Smith brand, along with his late wife and business partner, the American chef, supermodel, and lifestyle maven, B. Smith. Together, they produced B. Smith branded television shows, magazines, books, restaurants, and a line of branded home goods still sold at major retailers. Following Smith's 2013 early onset Alzheimer's diagnosis, the couple authored Before I Forget. Gatsby was Smith's chief caregiver during her illness and has become a leading voice for Alzheimer's awareness and caregiving. As a widower, he hosted a radio show caregivers on 77 WABC Col Columbus Media Radio. It is my pleasure to introduce Dan Gatsby. Julian? Yes, yep. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being here. You know, this, uh, this symposium that you've put together is nothing short of remarkable when you look at all of the people from all different backgrounds and particularly young people and the cross currents that uh, we all have that come together to form this one thing that we, we understand is important that at the end of the day, everything we do starts at the top, starts with our brains. And it's probably the most unrecognized major organ of our, uh, of our existence. It's what makes us human. And it what gives us the, the, the ability to hopefully one day overcome uh, this de devastating disease called uh, Alzheimer's or better known as one form of dementia. I'm here today for one simple reason, to thank you and the angels and warriors that you young folks are. My, my father once told me, he says, you don't owe me anything. I'm part of the past, but you owe your children the opportunity to be a better themselves, not me, but a better themselves and to give them that opportunity. And so Alzheimer's buddies, when I heard about it and had the opportunity to come to you and, and have the young folks on and speak to it, this is an honor, your warriors and your angels. I had the good fortune of being married for 28 years to one of the most dynamic human beings uh, I ever met. One of the sweetest, kindest, nicest, smartest, most beautiful, both internally and externally. Uh, her name was Barbara Elaine Smith, even her initials, B-E-S. She was truly the best, better known to millions as B. Smith. And as you mentioned, we, everything we basically set out to do, we did. Uh, she had restaurants, we expanded that into three restaurants. She wrote books. We turned those books into TV shows, to magazines, to products across the country. Uh, from Bed Bath & Beyond to the raw stores, what have you. We did things and we had one motto that when we got together, we were going to move and hopefully make millions. And we did that. But more importantly, what made this such a, a wonderful journey for me with her was that I never had one argument over 28 years with this woman. 
who I spent 24 seven, 365 with. We would be in the same room and we would be doing different things. And we would not even talk because she was on the phone or I was on the phone or she was making a presentation and we could look across the room and talk to each other with our eyes, not with verbally. She was that type of person that when she walked into a room, the candles would flicker. That's how dynamic and how kind she was. I could be in an event and she would be across the room and she would send me a whole paragraph of her thoughts just by a look. Well, one day I looked across the room and I didn't see that paragraph. Actually, I didn't even see a sentence. I saw a, a bewilderment, a befuddlement of what was going on. And I didn't pay it any attention because I thought, well, you know, maybe that's just, she's having an off day. What transpired over the course of time was if you didn't have modern meteorological technology, you wouldn't know if a rainstorm was just a drizzle or you have a cat five hurricane coming. Well, dementia and Alzheimer's is that because it comes on very slow, little things that make you go, what's going on? Why is she doing this? Or why is that person doing that? And that became more and more prevalent to the point where I said to myself, what's going, what's going on? She became more aloof, more distant, more a person that could walk into a room and just light it up with her, her presence and her, we used to say she had a Michael Jordan smile. She could elevate with her smile. And that smile went from elevation to just sort of a stare over a period of time. And when we got the diagnosis, we thought it was that my daughter and I, we talked about it. She started to read and, and became more and more difficult for her to understand things, but she was a doer, like a lot of the young folks here. We got the diagnosis that she had this beta amyloid plaque. We walked out of Mount Sinai Hospital and I can remember it like it was yesterday, over more than 15, 17 years ago. And she, she said to me, Dan, I'm broken. Uh, I know what this disease is. I know where it's gonna take me. I want you to tell our story. We've always been open. We've always been outgoing. We always, she was a donator whether it was for ch children's problems or women's issues or for poverty or for elevation of, of, of human rights, she believed in those things. She says, I want you to tell the story and I don't want you to back off one moment. And I want you, there's gonna come a time when you're gonna have to move on. And I want you to do that. And she said something else that I never forgotten. That's a picture of her during her modeling days in, in the background. And I wanted people to see that. She says, you know, you gotta understand when the what ifs become the what nows. So what are you gonna do? And I dedicated my life from that point, standing about seven blocks from Mount Sinai Hospital to telling her story. That's why we wrote the book before I forget. It's why I joined the, uh, the American Brain Foundation because the more I looked at what was going on and we incrementally started to tell people about our journey, the long, the long goodbye as they call it. And we saw within the communities of our different people that we dealt with, whether it was entertainment or it was in the restaurant business or it was socially, we saw how people reacted. We saw some people uh, were empathetic. Some people pulled away. Some people didn't want to, as someone said earlier, well, she looks fine now, but you're looking at a snapshot. You're not looking at the movie. 
You're not looking at the episode. You're looking at a snapshot. And we saw that, you know, in today's society, we have a thing called AI, artificial intelligence, which has transformed uh, our way of life and will continue to do so. But what we were dealing with back in those days and what we are still dealing with, and some of your panelists talked about it, we're dealing with the real AI of anger and ignorance. And that's the thing we've got to overcome today. And that's why I'm here. And that's why I believe so much in Alzheimer's buddies because the millennial generation, we need you. We need you because you're going to make the difference. You're gonna take and transform us because I'm 67 years old. I'm living a good life. I'm gonna live a good life. I've been through, as I, used, as I say, I've been in hell without the heat. That's what being a caregiver is. You know, there was a picture that was just shown of me. Uh, and that's how I looked. I lost my hair. I lost my eyebrows. I lost my ability to grow hair because of the stress of being a caregiver. I gave my wife a promise that I would take care of her. As she said to me, if one of us, way back when, if one of us becomes infirm, we will take care of each other and we will go on and live our lives, but we promised each other. And till I'm in my home right now, until the day she passed, I was there for her. So I want, I want those angel warriors, your, your Alzheimer's buddies to understand you're doing good work and it's gonna, you know, things in life that are challenges either make you better or they make you bitter. And the people that I'm looking at right now who are looking back at me, you're better. You're better for what you're doing. And I want to be your cheerleader. I want to be your, I'm a big fan. And that's why I'm here. And so what we have right now is a unique opportunity to begin. And, and I mean, it was, there was a stigma. I can't tell you what the stigma was 15 years, 10 years ago, five years ago. Think of it like this. Think of your computer 10 years ago, or think of your telephone 10 years ago, and the telephones you can buy or purchase or have right now. It's, it's exponential. We're going to find the cure, and you're going to be a part of it. The millennial generation may not be in my time, but the millennial generation I guarantee, I feel so certain about technology. I feel so certain about science. I feel so certain about you because your generation has a gestalt, has a worldview that is beyond the me and the selfishness that part of my generation is still uh, encrusted with. And so I look at what, Julian, what you're doing and what, what Alzheimer's Buddies is doing as the prologue to the transition of us taking this disease and taking all forms of dementia and all uh, brain related, whether it's traumatic brain injury or it's uh, uh, you know, Parkinson's or epilepsy or Tourette's or whatever, you know, part of what I, I do with the ABF is we talk about these things, it make a difference. And what we have right now is a unique opportunity for you to, your ambassadors, it's about Alzheimer's, 63% of all dementias are Alzheimer's. But think of it this way. They say every 60 seconds, someone's being diagnosed. Well, if you divide 60 seconds into a week of seconds, you get around 9,000 people every week in America that are being diagnosed just with Alzheimer's. That's not the other forms of dementia, whether it's vascular or what have you. And if you say at least one person is going to be impacted because they're going to be a caregiver, but let's just say because it's more, there's two. That means every week, 20,000 people are being impacted. And the stress, the sheer stress of it is, is mind boggling. You get no break. 
you get no relief. And then within the social dynamics of the families, because people call me up and people direct message me and they tell me the stories. You know, in, in the military uh, or in tough situations, you volunteer two ways. Someone says, I want someone to go into a difficult situation and there's a line of men and women and one person stands up, steps out. The other way it happens is I want somebody to go into a tough situation and everybody but one backs up. <laughs> and so you're left with the responsibility by virtue of being the only one. And I hear from people, caregivers, roughly a third live a shorter life. They don't heal as well. They have more chronic illnesses. They have more hypertension. They have more depression. They're more subject to having pain create opioid situations that they need because they're locked in a tsunami inside of a hurricane, inside of a, an inferno. And everyone can tell them what to do while they're taking care of someone who can't take care of themselves, but not tell them that they're the ones taking all of the heat. They're judging. And in life, you know, people can criticize and, and, and some people have the right to critique, but very few people create the opportunity for people who don't have the ability to take care of themselves to make it better or to incrementally keep them stable or safe. And so I'm here today to tell you as a fan, as a cheerleader, please tell more people your age about Alzheimer's, about you know, brain injury, uh, uh, about cognitive, you know, impairment, because we need you. We need you because you're the difference. It's not my generation, it's you. And so at the end of the day, you know, people talked about, you know, the things you need to do for uh, overcoming being a caregiver. The toughest language in the world is not Urdu or Mandarin, it's patience. The toughest thing to understand is that when you're dealing with someone with Alzheimer's or with some sort of cognitive disability, you can't always tell them the truth, but you can make them feel comfortable and safe. You've got to be able to tell them what's gonna keep them comfortable and stable. You have to maintain their dignity. And simultaneously, you have to maintain your sanity because it is truly hell without the heat. You're going to see and, and experience someone who could do everything, suddenly not be able to do anything. Someone who brought you in before you know who you were, not know who you are. Someone who, when you look into their eyes, you can see that distant light that is slowly being turned down the way you turn down a, 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 a light on a switch, pull it down and you see it go out. And who's gonna look at you and, and cry with their eyes without any tears coming out. So I wanted to be on this, this important symposium because I want people to know that no matter what, when you do the right thing, that young lady who gave up, she's, she's, she was the baby in the family, she gave up all of that, she will never, as I like to say, have to shudder all over herself. I should have done this or I could have done that. She'll never have, she did it. She's a warrior and she's an angel. And I wanna salute her and everyone on, on the panelists, the, the, the great uh, professionals that you had, this is important. It's a 21st century civil rights issue. Most of the people with it by virtue of longevity of life are women. Women control the household. They tend to take care of the next generation. Blacks are twice and Hispanics are two X times likely. It can devastate you financially. You can lose everything trying to care for someone. 
we have to be advocates. We have to get more money. And as you said so, so accurately, by 2050, this is a tsunami. The tide is still going out. But when it comes back in around 2035, 2040, it's going to take no prisoners. And so I ask every one of you to, to donate time, effort, treasure, money, uh, but awareness so that we can put this, this deadly, no, take no prisoners disease to, in the rearview mirror of our life. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you. That was a beautiful, powerful speech. Um, I don't think anybody could have said it better. Your wife seemed like she had an extraordinary life. And I'm so grateful that you're using your platform to make a difference. Um, we did receive a few questions, if you have um, time, that we would love to have you answer. My, my pleasure. Um, someone asked, what do you think we can do here at National Alzheimer's Buddies to offer caregiver support? Currently, we write letters to the families of patients and residents, but we want to do more. Uh, I would say there are various uh, congressional and Senate uh, committees uh, that you advocate for, that you send letters to, that you give them real life stories about people and the, and the positives and the negatives. I, I'd say that that's a very important thing. Uh, you know what? You're young and I bet you that some of the people that you support musically or, or the, uh, theatrically have someone in their family, send them a note and ask them to advocate for Alzheimer's buddies. Uh, you know, I, I think that those are the types of things where you get people who, that I, it's so ubiquitous now, you know, some singer or some actor or somebody has somebody in their family, send them a note and tell them, we need you in this struggle. I think that's important, but more importantly, Send, you know, in, in our book, I, I dedicated, uh, before I forget, to the United States Congress, and they have made changes, and we did get an Alzheimer's stamp. You know, the mind you save may one day be your own. <laughs> so uh, please, letters, uh, Instagram messages, whatever, just five minutes and get somebody else to send five, and that's what we need, constant, constant, squeaky grease crusher. Awesome, we have another question from our audience. Um, he asks, how do you, do you have any suggestions for handling when someone starts destructive behavior and how to handle the situation without them having get offended? A uh, couple of things. I, I can't say it works for everyone. We had a, a problem at times getting my wife in the shower and I would sing to her, you know, and I'm a terrible singer, but I would just, you know, bust out and, you know, you know, oh me, oh my, you know, I would sing or read the song or I would sing something, you know, a uh, hundred uh, bottles of beer on the wall and I'd make funny faces and you have to distract them. You have to distract them. You know, there were times where I'd go, oh, 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 oh. And she, are you okay? And just doing something like that would distract them from where they were to focus now on you. And then you go, oh, I'm okay, honey. I'm okay. I, I, I stubbed my toe. Uh, I stubbed my toe and then I put my hand on my head and then I, and I'd say a couple of little and start laughing and she would start, oh, you're being silly. It's little things that you have to try to do to dis distract them. Awesome, that's beautifully said. And just to close it out, one piece of advice for our volunteers um, that you've learned in your experience that you'd love to share with us. Yes. Well, you're gonna make mistakes. You know, this disease could make an atheist a pious person and make a pious person an atheist because why? I can't tell you how many times I cursed God. I, I, I don't want this. I can't. I can't wait to get away for for a way or for a few minutes. I don't ever want to come back. The moment I walked out the door, I was. I couldn't wait to get back. The moment I was in the house, I couldn't wait to get away. Forgive yourself. Forgive yourself. You. Nobody will kick your butt better than you. It's like the worst relationship any of you have ever had with another person who knew every button to push on you 
to make you a different person, you know even more buttons to push on yourself to make yourself feel even worse. So forgive yourself. That's amazing. Well, thank you so much for being here today. Um, is there a place where um, our audience members are able to buy your book or keep up to date? Yeah, with you, 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 you can go, well, you know, you can go to bsmith.com. You can see all of the, you know, and we're in the process of refiguring our business model to make donations. Uh, you know, we're at Bed Bath & Beyond, we're at Ross stores, we're at Kohl's and all those with bsmith products, home products. Uh, the book, before I forget, you can get it on Amazon or Barnes and Noble. But most importantly, uh, you know what? Donate to the Alzheimer's Foundation, uh, the Alzheimer's Association, the American Brain Foundation, which I'm a board member. Just whether it's a dollar or kind words or whatever, we need you. You guys and gals are the future. I really, I really, that's why I'm here because I just want to, I want to say thank you. Well, thank you so much. Um, that's a beautiful way to close our event today. And we're just so grateful that you could be a part of our event. Um, just to close off the event, I just want to thank everybody for being here tonight um, or today. 2021 marks our 10th anniversary of Alzheimer's Buddies. Um, and just before we close, I just want to highlight some of our wonderful accomplishments. Um, in the fall of 2011, our first Alzheimer's Buddies chapter was launched at Harvard University. <laughs> Um, thanks to our founder, Ryan. The next two years, we saw expansions to Gordon College, um, and we were featured on the cover of the lifestyle section of Boston Globe. In 2013, we had our first in-person symposium in Boston. In 2015, the incorporation of National Alzheimer's Buddies was launched. And in 2020, we had our first virtual symposium, and our volunteers got creative to overcome the barriers brought by the pandemic. Over the last 10 years, our organization has grown to over 30 college chapters and over 400 volunteers. We wanna thank everybody for your support. First, I would like to thank all of our speakers and panelists involved for contrib contributing to today's event. Thank you to our keynote speakers, Dr. Michelle Mikley and, Dr. and Dan Gatsby. Special thank you to Joe Daly from Molly's Movement. Please be sure to check out his website, riverwalkingsticks.com. That link will be in our website. And I just wanted to thank everybody again for attending our second annual National Alzheimer's Virtual Symposium. You will find a quick survey in the chat if you don't mind filling it out in order for us to receive feedback on today's event. In addition, November's Alzheimer's Awareness Month and NAB has been working hard to provide care packages for buddies. Please feel free to donate using the QR code. Thank you everybody for taking the time out of your day to be a part of this wonderful event. And please be sure to check out our website um, and stay up to date for a regular event. So thank you everybody for being a part of today's event. Uh, we really appreciate it. And we'll just um, keep the webinar open just so you can scan the QR codes to provide some feedback um, and please consider donating. Thank you so much.